Hello, my friends. I'm in the Limari Valley in the Coquimbo region, an up and rising production area in Chile, a long distance to the north of Santiago. In the Coquimbo area, the vines follow rivers, bringing water from the Andes to the Pacific Ocean. Over the past of time, these rivers have formed beautiful valleys with vines dressing the innumerable slopes providing extremely good fruits for the elaboration of wines of distinction. Traditionally, Coquimbo has been an area for the production of Pisco, the Chilean grape brandy elaborated with Muscat Apetit grain and Pedro Jimenez. This has been particularly important in the Elqui Valley. Still is. Indeed, we will visit the Pisquera, which is where Pisco is elaborated. But we will also visit wine producers in the three denominations of origin of Coquimbo, including the Elqui, the Limari, and the Choapa Valleys, and you will see how things have changed in the modern times. Enjoy the journey! The Coquimbo wine region is located in the north of Chile. Right below the Atacama Desert, with vines sitting at very low latitudes, only 30 degrees south of the equator. It contains three denominations of origin for wine production. The Elqui Valley is currently the northernmost of Chile's principal wine regions around 300 miles north of Santiago, the capital of Chile. Around 60 miles south of Elqui, we find the Limari Valley DO, the most recognized wine valley in Coquimbo, defined by the Limari River. Further south is the Choapa Valley, with the smallest wine production of the three Coquimbo DOs, but nonetheless exciting. Chile has been producing wine since the first European settlers arrived in the mid-16th century. This is not different when looking at the Coquimbo region, particularly in the Limari Valley where we are, where the oldest plantains are found. However, grapes in Coquimbo have been traditionally grown for table consumption and employed for the elaboration of pisco, which is the typical grape brandy of Chile and that is still elaborated in this area by many producers, particularly in the Elqui Valley. However, the climatic characteristics of Coquimbo, resulting from the combined action of the cool air descending from the Andes, fog entering from the Pacific Ocean, and the desert-like 
Dry weather associated to such a low latitude provides a unique situation that results in modern steel wines with their own identity and that start to be recognized around the world. We will visit several of these producers, but first let's pay a visit to a pisquera and see how pisco is made. I'm here in the Elqui Valley and I'm with Matias Rojas, who is owner and co-founder of Pisco uh -huh. Endemico. Hi, Matias. How are you? Thanks for receiving us. My pleasure, Enrique. This is a wine documentary, but I want to talk a little about Pisco. We're visiting you because in the Elqui Valley, the grape production has been used historically for the production of a great spirit that you make in Chile, that you call Pisco. Indeed, tell me when it, it started. Has it been a long time? Yeah, we've used it for a long time. The first Piscara dates back to around 1733, Hafin de Latore. Later came the denomination of origin, which is the first in South America, dating back to 1931. 1931, almost 100 years. With the modern denomination of origin, 300 elaborating commercially, but surely this goes further back with families. It is very likely, yes. I'm relying only on historical facts and records. I contacted you because I found it interesting how you present your pisquera. You haven't been around that long, only for five or six years. Correct. Yes, formally since October of last year, but we have been working on this for a long time, but we truly started in 2018. But why? You were a couple of friends who decided to make the best pisco in Chile? Exactly, yes. That was the goal, to achieve the best pisco in Chile. I'm a fanatic of Pisco, to be honest, my friends as well. I was living in Australia about two years, in 2016 and 2017, and I missed it a lot. So when I came back, I said, no, we have to export this. That too is one of our main goals. So from there, we start little by little buying the first still, buying the wine, doing experiments, making many, many mistakes. Until we reached 2022, where we could achieve our commercial patent, which is what allowed us to sell formally and legally. And you already have an interesting production, right? 15,000 bottles. 15,000 bottles a year. Very well. I'd like you to explain how Pisco is made, because it comes from the grape. In fact, the grapes that you use are... Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez. Moscatel Appetit Grain? Yes, correct. And with that, you make a wine an ordinary wine that you ferment in vessels. Is it a special type of fermentation for some class of alcohol graduation? Normally it's 14%. 14% when it's done, and it's a dry wine, it's not sweet, right? It's a little sweet, but it's white. It's a white wine with certain grape varieties that are purely pisqueras. So for pisco you can't have any type of oxidation, and you use nitrogen for it, right? Exactly. That's correct. We use high quality nitrogen to the extent that we lower the level so that it moves the atmosphere of oxygen, which is the one that can potentially spoil the quality of the wine. And then you use water, that you also need it to be very pure, because there is a high iron content that you need to eliminate. Correct. We have a pre-filter process and a series of filtering intended to reduce the iron content. This allows us to achieve excellent water quality, which is just as important as the quality of the grape and wine. Well, and here you have the still. If you want, let's go to the side. This is where the brandy is made, because until here you only have a wine of 14 degrees. Exactly. How does it work? Well, this is basically a huge cooking pot. This has a capacity of 300 or 400 liters. It's basically a big pot where the wine begins to heat. Here it begins to preheat as well. Then it begins to evaporate. What temperature does it reach? Around 90 degrees Celsius is when it starts to evaporate to distill the more volatile alcohols, in this case the methane, which is what we don't want. So the cut has to be very strict. We don't want a presence of impurities in our alcohol. So we start with the head. Keep in mind that we already have everything standardized, graduated, and we know at what time to close the valve. Then we take out the bad and start storing the drinkable alcohol, the ethanol. And the alcohol for the brandy, the pisco, comes to this. How is it called? 
the condenser. The condenser, and this is where it gets cold. Exactly. It's cooled by a coil of cold water, and that's where it's finished. And then from here, you put it in a tank until boiling. Exactly. It comes out at around 80 degrees, goes to storage, and the subsequent reduction. It has to reach 40 degrees. All of our alcohols are 40 degrees. I see. So from 14, you go to 80, and then from 80, you drop it to 40. Yes, down to 40%. To be 40 by law, or do you have a range? By law, they are graded. Grand Pisco, for example, is 43, 45, sometimes 46%. There's also reserve, which is our case, and special, which is 35 degrees. We are with the reserve one, because the truth is that it has always been our favorite. Well, I'm here in the Elki Valley, and I'm with uh, Giorgio Flesari, uh, who is an enologist, winemaker of Viña Falernia, and co-owner uh, of, the, of the winery. Glad to be here, Giorgio. How are you? Very well, thanks. Happy to be with you. The Elqui Valley is almost 500 kilometers north of Santiago. And from Santiago to the south is where Chile's best known wine production region begins. You are very far away. It's a very new area with a very peculiar climate, also very unique. But you're just a few winemakers. In fact, if we talk about the history of grapes, the production of Pisco is old, but the wine here doesn't go back many decades, maybe two or three decades. And you are pioneers here. Well, surely this is a business plan that was never well studied. I came from Italy in 1995 to visit my cousins who were here. And they left Italy in 1951. There, seeing the grapes they had for the production of Pisco, I told Aldo, my cousin. This grape is spectacular. Why don't you try to do wine? Three years later, we started putting together a new company. The field that you see in front of us here was planted by us starting in 1998, and we finished it in 2004. There are 125 hectares, so it's quite a big field. We started with traditional strains, but it didn't go particularly well with the Syrah. Initially, we began with Sauvignon Blanc, Later, we started to develop other vineyards, about six, seven years later, which were in the warmer area with Carmenere, a little Cabernet, and a little Malbec. We are offering something different from the rest of Chile. Behind me is Coquimbo, the coastal city that provides the name to this wine production region in Chile. In this section, we will cover the climate, geology, and soils of the Coquimbo region. At a latitude of 30 degrees south of the equator, this is a desert-like climate with very high summer temperatures and intense sunlight. However, given the long but narrow extension of Chile, the valleys connect the Andes with the Pacific Ocean in a very short geographic distance. This is important because the cooling influence of the Andes and the Pacific Ocean add together to delay fried, uh, fruit ripening, producing wines that show intense fruit flavors and fresh acidity, but high alcohol levels. The oceanic Humboldt current coming from the south of the continent brings morning fogs and cooling breezes to the region. However, there is still little rain as Coquimbo is situated on the edge of the Atacama Desert, which is the driest area in the world. Average rainfall levels are less than 100 millimeters per year, which is at the lowest limit for grape growing. It is for this reason that irrigation is essential in the Coquimbo region. I wanted you to explain me the climate of the Elqui Valley, which is quite peculiar, because although we are close to a desert, the Atacama Desert, the driest desert in the world, here you have a fairly cool climate. Why? Well, we have to separate the temperature aspect from the humidity aspect. In truth, the Elqui Valley is very dry. 
If we're lucky, we get 20 millimeters of rain a year. As you can see, the hills are completely dry. And the only possibility of having cultivation is where you can reach with a hose. Regarding the climate, it really is a climate that's unique, an almost cold climate. This is because the influence of the Pacific Ocean, just 12 miles from here in a straight line. The water temperature is very cold, and that clashes with the heat we have in land. This generates fog. This fog is around for 200 to 220 days a year, and it lasts from morning until midday, around 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. This really changes the microclimate. From the beach up to 25 kilometers away is humid. From there, the fog starts to ease up inland. Further inland, 52 kilometers from the coast, we have another vineyard, which has a very different climate. There is almost no fog. The day is much hotter. It can easily reach 30 or 32 degrees Celsius. Here, closer to the coast where we are now, the maximum is 24, 25 degrees. It gets to that very few times a year, normally 22 or 23, no more than that. All right, I'm here in the Limari Valley and I'm with Juan Carlos Coderch, who is enologist in Viñata Valley. Juan Carlos, thanks for receiving us. How are you? Very good. We are in the Limari Valley, which is surely the most recognized and oldest site with the oldest plantations in all of Coquimbo. The Limari Valley is quite large. You have vineyards on the coast and in the mountains. And here we are in a middle point. Can you describe the climate that characterizes this region? Yes, basically the climate is a cool, dry, desert climate. So it means that there are days with high temperatures and very cold nights. Here in the field that we are in currently, which is Espinal, together with Talanai, we have a proximity to the sea that allows a colder climate. Here, the maximum average temperatures during summer do not exceed 24 degrees Celsius. This is very good for the vineyard. The funny thing is that it is also dry. So, a very cool climate for the production of wine. We also have diurnal changes in temperature, which helps a lot for different flavors, and for the color of wine. Here we have marine influence, therefore there is a lot of Comanchica. What is that? Those are clouds. They come from the sea in the form of fog, which remain here approximately until noon or 1 p.m. in the afternoon. So apart from the fact that it's colder, there is also this absence of light itself. This produces wines that mature a lot slower, which allow better concentration in the grapes. I assume that the maritime influence of haze you have more noted in Talinay in the coast than here, but it's still dry. How much rain is there? On rainy years, it rains no more than 80 millimeters a year. Which means that you are below the grape production limit. I assume that you need irrigation here. Yes, we do need irrigation. Basically, it comes from the rivers and from the reservoirs because we're in a dry area that gets little rain. I'm now in the Choapa Valley and I'm with Gonzalo Galvez, who is a co-owner of Viña Choapa, who is a, that is a winery here in the, in the valley. Gonzalo, thanks for receiving us. How are you? Very well. Explain to me the specific climate of the Choapa Valley, which is surely different from the other higher valleys. Well, Choapa is the most southern valley in the Coquimbo region. It is the southern gateway to northern Chile. It is a transversal valley. It has two cords that go from the mountain range to the sea across the narrowest area of Chile. This one that we see here. Yes, right here in the narrowest area of Chile. There are about 94 to 97 kilometers between the Argentine mountain range and the Chilean coast. 
You were telling me that this is the youngest wine zone in all of Chile. Yes, because we're starting to transform the area from being a zone for Pisco to one for wine. Regarding the climate, well, this has been until a few years ago a Mediterranean climate, with seasons being a little more marked, but with climate change, it has become a little more semi-desert-like. At some point we reached 150 millimeters of rain a year, and now we are probably at 50. Also, the influence of the Pacific Ocean is also well marked here, with that mist that comes all the way to the vineyard. Yes, we have around 40 kilometers straight towards the coast from here. There are two mountains that cross each other, you may have seen it on your way here. They cross each other close to the coast. Generally, the fog goes through it and there's always humidity, which is very good. It also helps with the cold the vines need, which counteract the heat that we have in this area. As mentioned before, the Coquimbo area is defined by three main valleys, with vineyards situated in the valley floors and in the slopes of the mountains, following the main rivers of the area, the Elqui, the Limari and the Choapa rivers. Soils vary slightly between the three DOs, with some calcareous pockets mainly found in high altitude vineyards that help maintain the humidity in the terrain, which is crucial in an area with a desert-like climate. Many producers are now moving to the east end of the DOs, looking for the cooling influence of the mountains, planting vineyards as high as 2,000 meters in altitude, and more in some cases. We're in a vertical cut of your land, with a vineyard up there and more Sida down there, where the composition of the subsoil can be perfectly seen. What is this rock here? Yes, this is decomposed granite. It breaks easily with your hand, and there are cuts. You see, it practically disintegrates. And there are cuts where the roots of the plant go into. But obviously they won't find many nutrients since the soil is very poor. This actually gives the grape a very strong character. We have good maturity and very low production, and that sometimes isn't very friendly to our pockets, right? But it is a unique character. This is similar to, for example, the Cote Rodi in France, where Syrah is recognized quite well. The good terrain stays at 30, 40, 50 centimeters below the surface, no more than that. A little less at the bottom part there, a little more here. In another vineyard that we have in the valley plain, it has a totally different soil, with sand and stone, which is also very poor in organic substance and it's very difficult to handle because it needs more water than the ones here. The water leaves instantly as it's permeable sand. It's like pouring water into a basket. Let me start with Betas Blancas, which is your wine from the Espinal. On the label, it says Betas Blancas. It's basically because of the ground. Because in the coastal areas, whether Espinal or Talani, the beauty of those soils is that they present a very high calcium carbonate content. Basically lime soils. That provides something very specific to the wines. Freshness, minerality. Exactly. I would say that on one hand calcium carbonate helps a lot with the structure and mobility of water in the soil. That is very good. But on the other hand, since they're salts, they retain water. So I can irrigate, have a lot of water, have a lot of rain, but it's retained by these salts for the plant. And then there is a layer of calcium that is buried. Can we see it here? Okay, no problem. Look, here you can see the horizons we have here. 
Basically, here there's a bit of clay presence. Afterwards a sandy soil is laid, since the fat of these soils is its origin. It is a round, alluvial rock which is covered by lime. This lime comes from the mountain range. Its origin is from a mountain range and when it comes down with the water, the salt begins to deposit on top of this stone. Here is a good medium for root growth. Those are the roots of the vineyards. Yes, the deepen very well due to the lime content. The lime gives structure to the soil, but the problem with these salts is that they retain water. They give mobility in the soil, but for the plant it's not easily available due to the salt issue. So what we try to bring to our wines is basically from the plant being able to remove the water retained in the soil. The plant automatically creates a mechanism to acidify. This way, water can enter the plant. During the acidification, the plant structure, the leaves, the branches, the grapes, become more acidic. So, when this happens with the plant in calcareous soils, the wine is naturally acidic. We are where there used to be a river. The river Basin. Exactly. You can tell there used to be one by the stones that are all around the vineyard. And you can tell by looking here. Do you want to show me up close? Yes. It's very sandy. The organic layer is very short, so the root is no longer than 50 centimeters. So you can see how the vines have more of a horizontal base than a vertical one. This means the water level only reaches until there. That's the water level the vine looks for. Sand with pebbles tells about a low water retention. Very little, yes. That's why the root expands and there's high competition between vines. For this reason, each vine is planted far from each other. So they don't fight for water between themselves. I am in the Elki Valley, a wine producing area in the north of Coquimbo, right below the Atacama Desert. In this section, we will talk about the viticultural processes and grapes characteristic of Coquimbo. Viticultural practices in the Coquimbo region are varied, but they all revolve around the scarcity of water relying on irrigation techniques to guarantee the proper growing conditions for the grapes. The substantial decrease in snowfall in the Andes in the last couple of decades is making this situation more delicate, practically putting the wine production business in the region at serious risk. Viticulturists are choosing sites at higher altitudes where soils are at times better at retaining water, but this makes viticultural practices more challenging. We will learn about these practices from the viticulturists of the three different valleys. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? You have the sheep here eating the grass. Yes. To clean the soils, right? That's right. Very well. And you bring them every day? Every day of the week. Very well. Are those your dogs? These are my dogs. They help you guide the sheep, right? Yes, you need to teach them or they'll run away. Excellent. And how long do you do this work for? All day? All day, from Monday to Monday. Where do the sheep sleep? In their place. They have one back there. Very well. What's your name? Rodrigo. Pleased to meet you, Rodrigo. Very well, thanks for coming. Thanks.
We just met Rodrigo, who is the shepherd. He's a character. He comes here to clean the land. You do this every season to take off the weeds from the vineyard? He has his calendar well determined. This is done after harvesting, but before pruning. In other words, the animals eat all the grass that is left because it was left a little neglected because the people were focused on harvesting the grape. So the animals eat the grass and fertilize the soil at the same time. They help maintain a natural cycle within the field. There's sheep, there's goats, there's five shepherds with five different groups of animals. In total, there's more than a thousand animals that are in that field alone. It takes about a month to 40 days. And they eat everything. They eat everything. About viticulture, it surprises me a lot to find pararales in a dry place. Explain why these vines are here. Well, in the Choba Valley, we mainly work with this peril format. It's a Spanish peril. We use it to make peace go. We seek to produce more kilos per hectare. This format carries much more than a vertical trellis vineyard. So we started with that format, but transferred it for the winemaking. What we've had to do regarding viticulture is lower the loads. We went from 50, 60,000 kilos per hectare to 20, 10,000 kilos depending on the strain mainly within the grapes that are worked in the valley, which is in the Muscat family, Muscat of Alexandria, and the Pedro Jimenez. It works like this. These are 15-year-old vines. They're still young. You told me before that the weather used to be more Mediterranean, and now it's becoming more semi-desert or arid. And you have had a water problem. Actually, here you irrigate by water channels. By channels, yes, it's irrigated by flow. About five years ago, the drought issue was becoming a little stronger. We continue watering through flows channels, but irrigation technology is growing. What diseases do you guys have here? <laughs> None. That's the privilege of this valley. The truth is that we don't use pesticides or herbicides. And at this time, the animals begin to come down and we open our doors for their help before pruning. But to this day, we don't have any problems with plagues or something like that. Many grapes are grown in the Coquimbo region. Many of them international varieties that have adapted particularly well to this area. What grapes are found in the area depend very heavily on what valley you are in. In the Elqui Valley, Syrah and Sauvignon Blanc have sown well in the fog affected areas, where the cooling influence leads to wine with relatively high acidities and fresh fruit flavors. Here is where the highest altitude vineyards are found in Chile. Sites that seem to be outstanding for intensely fruit flavor, yet fresh Syrah and Carmenet. Chardonnay is the most planted grape variety in the La Mary Valley and the one responsible for international reputation. It produces wines in a full range of styles, from light-bodied examples with high acidity in the coastal areas to ripe and fruity styles in the east. Pinot Noir and Syrah are also found in Limari, together with Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Carmenet, particularly in the warmer eastern sides of the Dio. Choapa is the most recent experiment in Coquimbo, where Syrah seems to do particularly well. This vineyard is the largest we have. We started planting it in 1998 with some strain. That year, we made a mistake by planting Cabernet and Carmenere. Being a very foggy and cold climate, those grapes did not give us great results. So three years later, we took them out and replanted new ones. This is the vineyard you have here, which is the lowest and closest to the coast. To the coast, yes. Which is colder. Syrah, Sauvignon and Cabernet do better here, right? Syrah, Sauvignon Blanc. We have Riesling. We have Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. 
These five strains are the ones that work really good. And so Carmen Air? Carmen Air is in the other location, above the valley at around 25, 27 kilometers from here. The climate there is totally different. There is no fog, it's warm. The soils there are also totally different. They are from the basin of the Elki River. The soil is very sandy and lacking organic matter without any clay. So the irrigation there is very frequent, a few hours, but very frequent. In addition to what we have here in our vineyards of Muscat and Pedro Jimenez, we work with other producers, which is how we started. When we started the project, we toured the valley to see what strains there were especially in red grapes, because in the Valley of Pisco, there are very few red grapes. And we have been discovering some small producers who have half a hectare, one hectare of red grape Syrah, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Carmenere, which is what we work on now. And with them, we have made a partnership where we do the consulting of viticulture throughout the year, and then we have the harvest. And the truth is that we have had very good results. What kind of wine does Syrah give you here? It is a very fruity Syrah with red fruit, very easy to drink. It does not have a very high acidity. It is something that is characteristic of the valley, that there are not very high acidities, but it is very friendly, very easy to drink. It is elegant. We will try them later. They are easy to pair with food as well. The truth is that the wines produced here are very nice. They do not have a very high complexity. I am now in the Limari Valley, the best known denomination of origin of the Coquimbo region. If something varies strongly in Coquimbo is the winemaking. From fresh, light and vibrant whites in the coolest coastal areas to ripe and fruity reds in the Easter, there is no wine style fits it all in Coquimbo. And remember, this has been an area of production of Pisco for centuries, which still remains as one of the main industries in the region. First of all, what's important about Syrah is to harvest it at the perfect ripening point. This means not only the sugar, but also the maturation of polyphenols. It's harvested completely by hand and put into baskets. The grapes get to the winery in 30 minutes. We have three levels of Syrah. The single vineyard from one plot, which we've identified as number 16 in the vineyard. Then we have a Gran Reserva, which is made from the plot that is next to plot 16. We also have reservists that are made from different plots. So, Syrah is very easy as the grapes are easy to work with. If the grapes are of good quality, winemaking is very easy. The climate helps us a lot because there are no diseases. The character the grape has is always very spicy. The color is not missing because we have very high UV radiation and this stimulates the photosynthesis of the plant. Sometimes we have problems the other way around as it may raise the alcohol levels too much. This can be a problem because with 15% or more, it is much more taxed in several countries around the world. We have eight tanks. These tanks have pistons on top. The grape passes through the destemmer and the grinder, but we don't press too hard. It's very soft. When it reaches the fermentation curve, we add a little sulfite a little on top, and nothing more. The yeast is very important. We add it after a couple of days of cold maceration. All these tanks have a double temperature control system. Because of this, it's a lot easier having everything under control. In regards to Carmen Air, the grape comes from a vineyard that is three kilometers from here. Over there, the weather is much warmer. The difference is that here, 
40% is harvested at the usual time, and the other 60% a month and a half later. It's a natural process because there's wind and there are changes in temperature between night and day. In the morning, the temperature reaches 3 or 4 degrees. The Apancimento method is used in northern Italy to dry the grapes and to concentrate the sugar and flavors, right? Yes, so this means that water is removed by about 35 to 40 percent. All the rest remains concentrated. The wine has a totally different character. The aging is done in American oak. This is for Carmenere. I assume that they also reach high alcohol levels, right? Well, if you leave it alone, the apasimento part can make it up to 17 or 17.4 percent. Then you blend it with the other one. Yes, in the end it reaches 14.5 or 14.8. Finally, we have Pinot Noir, which is the youngest, the last one to make it in our portfolio. It comes from a vineyard that has a colder climate. We have a completely different process with this, because we don't use the deposits with the pistons that are in here. Instead, we use small stainless steel vessels. If you look, we have two over there, each of 1,500 liters. It is all done manually, kept in there for 8, 9, 10 days. After that, the wine is put directly into the barrel. Juan Carlos, we are in your barrel room, where the wines age. I'd like you to explain the elaboration to me. This colorful aging that you do to maintain the characteristic of the terroir of your land, which is what you want to sow in your wines. How do you do it? Yes, a very good point, because when we talk about the vineyard, the climate, and the soils that we have today, we look for a wine that's made representing the region. It's a wine from one place. So for us, if the barrel is very powerful in its aromatic charge, it is a diverter from what we want to have in the bottle. For this we are very cautious and careful. We have a barrel pull of approximately 600,000 liters, so we pass a large part of our wines through barrels. So we have an organization in such a way that the Gran Reserva wines will spend about six months in the barrel. From this to our high-end wines, which can see up to two, two and a half years in barrels. French or American oak? 100% French oak, from different brands. I want to ask you to explain briefly the production of each of your wines. Not all, but for example, Sauvignon Blanc which is precisely the one that does not enter into barrels. How do you do it? Sauvignon Blanc is a 100% fermentation in inert vessels, where the most important point for me, especially with Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, is the harvest point, where we define how the wines will be like at the end in the bottle. But of course, Sauvignon Blanc ferments 100% in stainless tanks and goes to rest without barrels. Then we bottle them. But then we have varieties like Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and the other reds that go to these barrels and according to the category they're in, is the time that they'll spend in the barrel and on which barrel. We don't do malolactic conversion with Chardonnay, it ferments in stainless steel. There's a small portion that ferments in barrels to then make a final blend of the three categories that we have defined. We don't stop malolactic fermentation right away. We let all our Chardonnay pass through barrels, the Vedas Blancas in particular. And obviously we check each barrel so that the fermentation does not start. But the wine does mature a little more, because tea is a vertical wine with very good acidity. You also have a Cabernet Franc that I personally like, the Betas Blancas, right? How did you make it? Part of what we want to look for in a bottled wine comes from the fermentation. From the harvest up until the wine is 100% done and separated from its skins. From this alcoholic fermentation in which the wine is already made up to the barrel it takes about a year, a year and two months, no more than that to avoid losing freshness. 
We are in the room where the wines are resting, waiting to go on the market at some point. Explain me how you make them. Let's start with the sparkling wine. Look, the sparkling wine is a rarity. It is an invention that we made, that we gave the freedom for the winemaker to use it in a winery as I would like, with the musts we had in Chile. The standard with respect to sparkling wines is Chardonnay. But we have to take advantage of the strains that we have here in the valley. So we came up with making a sparkling wine based on Muscat. It is a sparkling wine that has three Muscats. It has Pedro Jimenez, Muscat of Alexandria, and Muscat Rosado. It's a sparkling elaborated by the Charmant method. So a sparkler with very light bubbles. Super friendly, easy to drink. With a very tropical nose, a very smooth mouthfeel, very easy to drink. Made to enjoy. The Charmat. Uh, can you explain the process very quickly? Yes, yes. The classic method is the champenoise or traditional method. It's how champagne is made with a second fermentation in the bottle. Where the yeast is applied in the bottle, a second fermentation is generated inside the bottle. In the Charmat method, which is the Italian method, the second fermentation is made in inert stainless steel vessels. It is a larger format, and we chose it because it is not so invasive with respect to the yeast. It doesn't take on as many yeasty notes. And since we are a very young region that is just becoming recognized, we wanted that people can try our wines and begin to identify the specific flavors of our grapes. So, if we use the traditional method, it would give us those notes of yeast, of toasted bread, that they were going to be above the wine. And you have another white that is not sparkling. It is also a blend of muscats. Yes, this is a dry blend. A dry white from a blend of Muscat of Alexandria, Muscat from Austria, and Pedro Jimenez. It's our most awarded wine. A blend that was born in 2018. It's a wine with more tropical notes, very well balanced, with a rich acidity. It is a wine that does not have a very long finish, and it is easy to drink. It is a very iodized wine, with high salinity and minerality. Very good for pairing. How is the elaboration? It is done separately, each grape in a different tank, with different fermentations separated for each one, and then when the wine is ready we do the assembly. And then you have several red wines, but Carmenet is the most typical grape in Chile. Yeah, what happened worldwide with Carmenere is that it was confused as Merlot. Similar thing happened to us here too, since we discovered that there was a very small producer who had half a hectare of Carmenere with very young vines. We are exploring the potential that Carmenere has here, as it provides very fruity characteristics. And finally, I want you to explain Syrah to me. It seems to be doing very well here, in Coquimbo in general, but specifically here in Choapa. The truth is that it has taken a big boost here in the north. It is a variety that is found from end to end in Chile, and from the coast to the mountain range. It happens very well everywhere, but here in the north it gives wines that are a little easier to drink, without so much complexity. They are very enjoyable wines. And we also make here a Sierra with 12 months of aging in barrels. This one is made in barrel of a third use that only seeks to round out the wine and allow a little oxygenation. As we come to the end of our documentary, we also enter the best part, which is tasting the wines produced in this area. And I'm lucky to be accompanied by Melissa Del Campo on this journey, who will stay with us to try the wines. Thank you, Enrique, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. We will taste both whites and red, light and full body wines, and of course, Pisco. And we will do it by the hands of these outstanding North Chilean winemakers that have opened their houses to show us how wine is produced here in Coquimbo. We will also try some of the most characteristic dishes of the area. Do not close your eyes. Matias, we are in your tasting room, which is under construction, and we have a companion. Yes, of course. My partner, Nestavia. She didn't want to miss the tasting. We're trying your three piscos. Let's start with the muscat. All of these are 40% alcohol, 
but we'll go from the most aromatic to the most neutral. Okay, let's get it started. The particularity of this Pisco is that it's a well-done single distillation. If you shake it, you can smell the fruit. Muscat is a very small berry, very intense. If you feel closely, your nose doesn't itch at all from the strength. And this means that there is only drinkable alcohol, which means it's a very good quality. It has that essence of muscat wines, the same type of aromatics. And on the palate, you can assimilate summer fruits, seasonal summer fruits. It is a very fruity pisco that goes very well by itself with ice or with cocktails. The art in the Muscat bottle is characterized by the guanaco, which is part of the llama family. It's our engine color because it represents the Andes mountains of this region. Hence the color of a sunset. Let's move on to the blend, which is characterized by the Guidna cat. It is a feline, also Andean, from the central and southern regions of Chile, especially Araucania. This feline characterizes this Pisco because it is actually very cunning and manages to capture the best of both varieties of Muscat and Pedro Jimenez. Fantastic. Hmm, it has, I noticed the aromatics of the muscat, but it has some herbs as well, right? Correct, yes. These are the herbs from Pedro Jimenez that you feel there. Personally, it's my favorite, not only because of the Guidna cat, but because it is very versatile, it works very well with whatever you want. It translates well in the mouth, from nose to mouth. But wow. You can feel the spices. Yes, yes, I like it a lot. It fills your palate. It gives you the bitterness in the bag. Yes, it does, correct. Phenomenal, very good. And finally? This one is Pedro Jimenez. This one is characterized by the Humboldt penguin. It's the box with the blue color. It is a very friendly pisco. It goes with everything. It is very easy to drink. It's very friendly in your mouth. Is that penguin from the south of Chile? It's from here, from the coast, from the current of Humboldt. Oh, right, because they come with the current. Yeah, the aromatics are more reserved. It does not come out as fruity anymore. Here, the spices dominate much more. Yes, the spices. It is also more reserved on the palate, but it's true that it gives you that spicy taste at the beginning. Almost like white pepper. Yeah, it is. It is very good. Wow. Well, to both of you, thank you so much for welcoming us. I hope you have good luck and that the business continues to grow as it seems to be doing. I think you had the perfect marketing approach, like they say in the United States. And it's been so nice to meet you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Giorgio, we're with Melissa Del Campo, who is accompanying us for the tasting. Let's start with your Pinot Noir. We're tasting it straight from the barrel. Trying a wine from the barrel is something that isn't very common. And in fact, it's a really good formula of explaining what the process is. It's good for explaining how it gets from the vineyard to the bottle. Here, the wine has already completed the malolactic fermentation, and now it's in the phase of aging. And this means that it will stay here a while for it to complete a natural evolution. It 
it already has its character, its aroma, its specificity of fruit, of black cherry. Yes, on the nose, it's pleasantly aromatic. Yes, especially fruity. In the mouth, it has a very soft path. Red wine is very difficult to produce because the smallest details can make a large difference in taste. This is uh, Syrah, also from the barrel. It's a 2022. It's almost ready to be taken out of the barrel. This is finishing its time in the barrel. We're soon taking it out and later preparing the bottling. This has a spicy aroma. Yes, spices. My favorite thing is the color. We always have an intense color here. The pepper aroma is always present here. On the palate, very spacious. Ripe tannin, elegant tannin. It doesn't interfere. It has a good body. It has good fruit, good balance. It has it all. This wine is spectacular. Especially the fruit on the palate. It's an explosion. And the pepper. But it's true that it's in the European style that it's in found so much in other places. Well, we always try to have a product that's as elegant as possible. We want it to be for the consumer. We want it not to be hard to drink, but also for it to be an important wine. So we finish with the Carmenere, with the Pacimento. A Pacimento. Well, let's try it. This comes from a place that's close to the town Vicuña, next to the river Elqui, pure sand and riverbed rock. It's very clean on the nose. It's stored in American oak. It's the 2022 vintage. It's been in the barrel for 10 months. I find notes of phrasing. Yes, that's correct. On the palate, it has its uniqueness. It has good oak that is clean and not too powerful. I can say that once I start drinking it, it's hard to stop. Yeah, that's right. It's almost sweet. But it keeps being fruity. It doesn't have sugar. It's just the ripe tannin. And then the secondary flavors that give you the flavor on the palate. Well, Giorgio, thank you very much. With this wine, we say our goodbyes. Thank you for welcoming us and showing us the vineyards and the winery. Hopefully we meet again soon. In the near future. Well, Juan Carlos, we're starting the best part, which is the tasting. Plus, we have a great selection. We're starting with the Sauvignon Blanc, right? This is from a vineyard that is 10 kilometers from the sea. The winery is approximately 30 kilometers from the sea, but the Espinal plot is closer to the ocean. I can feel some green notes. And it's very mineral. The salinity is very noticeable. Enologically speaking, it's a wine that is made very similarly to others. But the big difference is the amount of lime that this sector has in the soil. On the palate translates in the same way, it's green. Right, these levels of herbs I like to say are more developed than the vegetable notes. Which is what characterizes this winemaking region. Well, let's move to the next. Next, this is a new product. It is a wine that we produced and recently hit the market. It will soon be in the United States. It's a Chardonnay Italian I Caliza. It's our superior quality of Chardonnay. It comes from the same Italian I vineyard and from the same mountain range of lime, which is from the same sector of the Tallinn vineyard. This is made a little more oxidative but always making sure that it's not an excess of oxidation. 
It has a citrus character mainly. And very fresh. You can't tell of much oak characters. It has a toasted point from the barrel. It's very soft. It has bullion, structure, herbs, and it has a lens in the mouth with a very good finish. The taste is still there in my mouth. It's our Pinot Noir pie. It is our superior Pinot Noir wine. They have rated this wine quite highly, right? Yes, quite high at an international level. In fact, the first year we presented it, which was 2020, the Chilean Wine Guide gave it the Best Wine of the Year award. It's much like a Pinot Noir, but it has that hint of browniness to it. The thing about it is the sector of the vineyard it comes from, is that lime is firmly present. It's a sector that is planted in high density, the berries are very small. If one wanted to, it could be made very concentrated. We don't want that, though. We go for a Pinot Noir that's more subtle and elegant. During fermentation, the extraction is very little. So in the end we get this. It's complex, there's fruit, but I also smell herbs. It's very little fruit. A fraction is fermented with stems because we want the freshness, and for it not to be over-extractive. We are very careful with this, because we want it to be very gentle on the palate. We want it to be friendly, with volume, with tannins that are present, but very gently. On the nose it's a complex wine with layers, and quite sanguine. Yes, it's very interesting. Exceptional. It's super complex. It has so many layers of flavor. It does give you that note of blood. Almost a metallic flavor at the end. But it keeps evolving. Flavor then more flavor, not to mention the tannins. All of it goes very well together on the palate. The acidity maintains the wine for a long time, in different parts of the mouth. This wine ages in oak barrels for two years. The oak in the wine is present, but it doesn't overpower. Well, Juan Carlos, thank you very much for showing us the wines, the selection of whites and reds that you have here with a common characteristic, which is the terroir. I think you achieved it very well. What do you think, Melissa? I love them. I am fascinated by the characteristic of each wine, which takes you to the terroir, like you mentioned and they are fresh and fruity at the same time. Truly fantastic wines, thank you very much. A pleasure to host you, come back soon. We're gonna try some of the cuisine characteristic of the Coquimbo area, and we will start with goat cheese that is actually found everywhere here. Yeah. But it's prepared in two different styles, right, Melissa? Yes, so they give us to try fried goat cheese, and um, uncooked goat cheese with olive oil and so oregano, which I'm very curious to try. Yeah, let's try with that. Let's start with this one. Mm. We have tried it before, and um, I continue thinking that this is actually softer than the goat cheese that usually is very strong from Europe, like France or Spain or Italy, right? Definitely is, and the olive oil and the oregano, it makes all the flavors more fresh. Yeah. I agree. The fruit, the, the fried one. Mm. It gets better. It gets better, I think, yeah. It's a good mix, the, the fried bread with the cheese, mm -hmm. I guess. We have a Chardonnay from the Limari Valley, where we are. Actually, from Villata Valley, that we, will, we have visit. And that I believe is perfect to accompany the, the cheese, right? Definitely balanced cheese. Great choice. Good. Well, now we have another very typical dish from the area. Melissa, what is that? Yes, this smells are amazing. This is a goat stew, typically from the Limeri uh, Valley. Mm -hmm. So, are you ready to taste it? I am, and it's on a um, base of potatoes, and it looks really, really tender. 
And we have a Cabernet Franc also from Vignata Valley to accompany. The smell. And I think that is going to be. And the taste is amazing. Mm. It's perfect a perfect pairing. pairing. Well, fantastic. It is a fantastic afternoon to taste the wines after all these explanations. And we're going to start with your sparkling wine. This is our Akalari sparkling wine of the Akalari line with Brut and Extra Brut. As I mentioned before, it is a blend of three different muscats. Very fruity, very tropical, easy to drink, elaborated with the charm method. Let's try them. We have Melissa here, who is a fan of a sparkling wine. She likes all of them. I am here waiting for it. This one is different. Different to what you may be used to. There is no bitterness. It is very tropical. But it is not an extremely ripe fruit. We are not even talking about a jam. Oh, it's really tropical, for sure. It smells like pineapple. Yes, pineapple. <laughs> Some orange as well. Yes, it tastes like orange peel. Very fine. Yes, delicate. It's fresh. It has 12.5% alcohol and 9 grams of sugar. Almost sweet. The next one is the blend of Muscats. The blend of Muscats, correct. This is our most awarded wine. Here in Chile, very little white blends are done. It's today our most awarded wine, having been named Revelation Blend for two years in a row. It is a blend of Muscat of Alexandria, Muscat of Austria, and Pedro Jimenez. We could say that this is our most complex wine. The entertaining thing about this wine is more than anything the mouth that displays. With those mineral notes that make it similar to a Gewürztraminer or a Riesling. It has those strong characteristics with white flowers and minerality that makes it very refreshing. And the other interesting thing about this wine in the mouth is the creaminess that makes it ideal to accompany seafood dishes that are a little more complex, heavier. But it is still an easy drinking wine with a medium finish. It is not eternal. It's savory and balanced. Also with a tropical character, but more like kiwi. The kiwi is a good descriptor as it has that sweetness balance with the acidity. It activates the mouth. It has tension. It has good body as well. The acidity makes it refreshing and helps to showcase the flavors. Yes, it is not a heavy acidity. It is an easy wine. We will finish with the Syrah. With the Syrah that is from the Cordillera Mar line, that unlike the Choapa line that was more for appetizer, here the wine is thought to be paired with food, a more gastronomic wine. The main difference is the kilos of grape per hectare, which is about half of that used in the Choapa line, and the type of aging, as this is aged in barriques. These are barrels of third use. The wine spends 12 months in barriques of third use to avoid a very aggressive intervention of the oak during aging. It has a very deep color. And the aroma can be felt from here. This is something very characteristic of the valley. They are all very expressive wines. Black fruits. Some spicy character. Pepper, a bit of pepper. It never gets too strong in any characteristic, but you can feel it. It is like very fine powdered black pepper. It fills the mouth completely. That's true. This is a wine that would pair very well with strong dishes, but not very spicy ones. I recommend pairing it with a risotto or a pasta. That works super well. It is a great compliment. What a great wine. Fantastic. Gonzalo, very exceptional wines. This place of yours is very authentic. We wish you good luck carrying the Choapa Valley's flag. In fact, I find this place, well, difficult to get to, but extremely exciting. And well, thank you very much for your time and for teaching us all these new things. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and giving us the opportunity to show our project, our work.
As you know, this is a super hard work. But we believe there is a great opportunity here. We expect a lot in the incoming years. We are young and feel that we are still learning. But the truth is that we feel that we are going a good path to show the potential that the valley has regarding the wines. Great deal. Cheers. Cheers. Chile is an impressive country, narrow and long, with mountains and the ocean. With glaciers and deserts, it has it all. What would you say to close this documentary, Melissa? Wow, Coquimbo is a pretty unique area in the north of the country where you can find the most amazing wines there could be. But the best, it's people. I could stay here for the rest of my life. But we need to move to the next region. Would you accompany us? Of course, let's do it. Great, don't miss the next wine documentary. Until we, just, until we see you again, cheers. Cheers.